My name is Clarence Cormier. I'm the Provincial Electrical Administrator. As you can see on the screen, I work for uh, SDS, which is uh, Standards Development and Support. Uh, that's uh, James Orr and John Elliott, Director Level. Uh, also, we work for uh, Community and Technical Support. That's the Executive Director Level. Our new Executive Director is Sean Wasiak. And uh, we also all work for Technical and Corporate Services. Uh, that's our ADM level, uh, Dale Beasley. And of course, we're in the Department of Alberta Municipal Affairs, uh, which is uh, DM level, Deputy Minister Paul Winnick. So uh, let's, let's move on and uh, see what we can do today. And thank you very much once again for coming. And so, there we go. So I thought I'd start off very quickly with the electrical code regulation and then do a small piece on the utility code and then the large uh, portion of course will be on the Canadian Electrical Code Part 1. So uh, as you may know, um, we have Electrical Code Regulation which starts us off in the Electrical Discipline and talks about the Electrical Discipline under the Safety Codes Act. And uh, one of the things it does is it, it uh, adopts national and provincial electrical safety codes. There's a picture of the front page there. And of course you can get it uh, electronically uh, free as far as I know at uh, Alberta Queen's printer. And um, take a look really quick. Uh, again, five sections, definitions. We have a section on section two on equipment, section three on the codes, and then four and five are administrative uh, things. Uh, so if we go, there's a, a screenshot or a picture of what it looks like inside. And that uh, gives a couple of uh, definitions of the act. Uh, what a certification body is, what an inspection body is. And uh, when you see that word inspection in, in, the, in that context, it's talking about uh, for equipment, not for installation. And uh, again, the equipment piece is down below there. And uh, it tells you basically uh, what uh, has to be done for electrical equipment in the province of Alberta. Uh, again, there at, uh, in, in item two, it says no person shall manufacture, install, sell, or offer for sale. So again, we, we, a lot of the RSCOs will think of 2-024 in the code with regards to uh, approved, uh, approval of electrical equipment. This goes above and beyond that and that's in the regulation. So anything in the regulation overrides the code. And also it uh, doesn't just talk about install or which part one is an installation code. It talks about manufacturing, selling or offering for sale. So uh, again, this portion of the regulation is a, it, it, it agrees with 2-024 and then it goes above and beyond and adds more, more items on there. Uh, then we continue on. Um, we see item three there basically uh, doesn't uh, make the same requirements for utilities. And then uh, in section three down under codes declared in force, it shows the two codes uh, that are in force uh, right now in, uh, in Alberta, the uh, Canadian Electrical Code Part 1, the 2018, and of course the uh, Alberta Electrical Utility Code 2016. So, we also have a stand data uh, on uh, that, um, and uh, that uh, shows the whole stand data, basically talks about what I just finished talking about and how electrical equipment has to be approved by its EB or an IB. And then at the bottom, you can see the two links for uh, certification and inspection with the Standards Council of Canada. Uh, it's been a great controversy to, because uh, we used to put them all on here, all the marks and so forth. And um, we were told to take them off, not just our discipline, but in other disciplines, they've been slowly coming off. Uh, and also uh, I've met nationally with uh, my counterparts in the national level. And uh, what's ended up happening, and I don't think it's happened yet, but they've been putting pressure on the Standards Council of Canada to uh, make their website a little bit more user friendly when it comes to certification and inspection bodies and looking them up and so forth. So hopefully we see something on that and as soon as I see it, I'll be letting the Safety Codes Council know about, uh, about that item. So hopefully that uh, occurs soon. And again, there's a repeat of what I mentioned there about no person manufacturing, installing, selling, or offering for sale any electrical equipment 
uh, in Alberta unless uh, it's been approved by a CB or an IB, that's a certification body or an inspection body, again, in the context of equipment, not installations. We also have our notice that we put out whenever the things change. So, you know, a new code gets adopted and put into force, you'll see one of these come out. And again, the notice there is, is repeating what's uh, already been said about the new codes that are in force right now uh, in Alberta. We see also that the oil and gas uh, facilities that we uh, affect is no longer adopted. And also, this I notice provides information on purchasing or creating the codes and a couple of useful links there. So one of the things that's come up in our conversations with the Safety Codes Council and their sub-council working groups is uh, trying to clarify the point of demarcation between the utilities and the consumers. And so in some of our correspondence, um, th this is a quote that I found that kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's a good one for, for establishing that. It says in general, uh, electrical installations on the supply authority side of the demarcation point are regulated by the Alberta Electric Utility Code, whereas electrical installations on the consumer side of the demarcation point are regulated by the CE Code Part 1, Canadian Electrical Code Part 1. So that's a general statement and there are some exceptions that we'll talk about after. And here's a typical example that most people are familiar with. If you, if you have a house or you've been to a house or looked up before you went in the house and you saw the electrical service coming in. And uh, basically what you see there is a uh, weatherhead and the conductors coming in from the utility. You can see them coming in and uh, there's some connections there. And then you see the wires coming out from the uh, weatherhead that are part of the consumer's uh, equipment. And then the connections are made. So on the consumer side, everything is regulated by the Canadian Electrical Code Part 1. Whereas uh, on the supply authority side or the utility side, everything is regulated under the utility code. Is uh, it, it, it assumes things like uh, an engineering department, maintenance departments, stuff like that there that uh, you know, the Canadian Optical Code Part 1 with consumers, that's not assumed. So there's the two exceptions I was talking about with regards to that demarcation point. Uh, if you're on the consumer side, but you're a corporation accredited by the uh, Safety Codes Council for both the utility code and part one, then you can use the utility code for certain things. And also if you're uh, a municipality and that, you know, that, that's under contract with the supply authority for care and control. So, you know, you may have a primary metering situation where the supply authority or the utility provides power to a municipality and uh, they stop at a certain demarcation point. And then after that, it belongs to the, the city, but the city doesn't want to have care and control of that thing because they don't want to have that all meet part one. They want it to still be under the utility code. Then one way for them to do that is that they can hire and have a contract with the supply authority to have care and control of that consumer owned installation and in that way, they can apply the uh, utility code to that portion of the work. There's a picture of what the utility code looks like, the front cover. And again, it's uh, a collaborated effort with uh, the Alberta government, Alberta Municipal Affairs, and the Safety Codes Council. And um, the Department of Municipal Affairs and the Safety Codes uh, Council both report to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. There's the contents, just uh, quickly going over just what the sections are. We have section zero being the object scope and definitions in the utility code. Section two is the general rules. Section four is not used. It used to be the, the safety rules that are OHS related. So that's why that was taken out. Uh, section six is grounding of other than overhead and underground power lines. Section eight is substations and electrical equipment installations. Section 10 is overhead systems which uh, makes a normative reference to uh, Canadian Electrical Code Part 3, I believe it's number one. And uh, Section 12 is underground systems, 
which makes a normative reference to the Canadian Electrical Code Part 3, uh, number 7, I believe. And then there's, of course, figures and tables. So that's just run down to what's in the utility code, if anybody's wondering. And there's also some more appendices there. There's the safety rules, Appendix A is the safety rules. That used to be Section 4, and that's all the occupational uh, health and, uh, and safety items uh, for worker safety in utilities, and uh, that may disappear in the next, uh, in the next edition. There's a picture of what the uh, overhead systems uh, looks like. Again, just like the Canadian Electrical Code Part 1 is also known as C22.1, the Canadian Electrical Code Part 3 is known as C22.3. And that's what you see at the top right there, C22.3, number one and dash 15 because it was published in 2015. And also we see the underground systems, C22.3, number seven, dash 15. And those were those are normative references. So in in other words, they're these 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 two uh, items, the overhead systems and the underground systems, are basically indirectly adopted uh, by the utility code. So they're adopted in Alberta, but because they're part of the utility code, the utility code adopts them and then with amendments. So they don't just stand alone in Alberta; they're adopted as part of the utility code. There's also some stand data that uh, have come out recently with regards to uh, the utility code. Um, one of them is here talking about uh, the consumer's service connection. And uh, there was a request for clarification regarding the demarcation point, as I mentioned, between consumer installations and uh, the utility or the supply authority installations. One of the reasons why you'll see that word supply authority instead of utility sometimes is because supply authority uh, is a defined term in the Canadian Electrical Code, where utility is not. The utility isn't defined in other places, but sometimes uh, if we use supply authority, then everybody knows what you're talking about as far as part one goes. And it gives uh, some code references there from, from the utility code, 2-024 Consumer Service Connection, as well as uh, Canadian Electrical Code Part 1, Consumer Service. And so basically, in order to meet all these requirements, you basically have to know where the demarcation point or points are so that everybody knows this is regulated by this code and this is regulated by that code, i.e. Part 1 code or the utility code. It can't be regulated by both. If you have an electrical installation, it's either regulated by part one or the utility code, each portion. So when you look at a portion of an installation for electrical, it has to be one or the other. So you can have, again, as we mentioned, you're gonna have a demarcation point and the whole electrical installation is gonna include you know, the supply side and the consumer side. But usually the supply side is under the utility code and the consumer side is under part one. And again, it gets a little bit more complicated with the exceptions and so forth, but it's good to think of it that way and realize that, yeah, everybody should know where that demarcation point is. And if, if you have any questions about where that demarcation point is, the first person to ask is the safety codes officers on both sides of, of that demarcation point. So if there's a safety codes officer, obviously on the consumer side, that would be a group A safety codes officer for electrical. And then on the, on the utility side, the supply authority side, they have group B inspectors and uh, they would know also where, and, and that's, they would come to an agreement if there was any, any question as to where the demarcation point is. There's that, um, under part one, there's that definition for supply authority that I talked about. Any person, firm, corporation, company, commission, or other, organization responsible for an electrical power distribution network that connects to a consumer service. And so there was a discussion about how, how that, uh, you know, works out. And uh, basically uh, the interpretation was that um, location of the demarcation point uh, can be unique for each customer as determined by the supply authority for the purposes of determining the demarc between the Canadian electrical code and the utility code. It, we give a list of typical uh, points of demarcation. So there's some typicals 
again, for anything else, uh, talk to your SEOs and uh, the demarcation should point, as it mentions at the bottom, should be identified in all cases. It shouldn't be a question. Where's the demarcation point? Which code do we use? You should know that. So we also have uh, an errata with regard to the utility code. We had to reintroduce uh, some um, missing former Section 10 uh, code clause in Section 2 that uh, got moved, but it never ended up getting moved. <laughs> so we just uh, did that there, and uh, there's the particulars. And if anybody has any questions on that, of course, they can always touch base with me after. And there was an errata that went out, and it talks about if there's some more, a little, uh, little bigger print. And uh, that went out for rule 2-032 operation and maintenance. Now we're on to the Canadian Electrical Code part one. And again, we've already seen how that part one means something. Um, the, an average layperson wouldn't know what that meant, but of course SEOs know what it means. And again, it's a safety standard for electrical installations. Uh, the equipment part, which is also uh, falls under under us, as you saw from the regulation, is uh, one of the one of the pieces in this book that helps us regulate the equipment is Appendix A, uh, which uh, lists all of the uh, Part Two standards, so C twenty two point two Part Two standards, as well as standards from other organizations that have been approved by the Standards Council of Canada to do standards for Canada, and uh, that, that deals with the equipment part. And again, normally we don't delve too much into that. Uh, we usually let the, uh, the CBs and the IBs, the certification bodies and the inspection bodies, um, take care of that. They know which uh, standards they have to use and so forth. But uh, from our perspective as SCOs, we're looking to make sure that the, uh, the equipment that uh, we see when we do our inspections on installations is uh, approved and not counterfeit and, uh, and that uh, it's uh, safe. So go into uh, part one, we, we had again lately we've had some stand data on part one. Um, here's, uh, here's one here, I just went through some of the sections with some of the latest stand data. If you haven't seen this already, here's one on section zero. Uh, this was a um, a nice piece on retroactive application of requirements, uh, which talks about, uh, you know, when is something retroactive? And uh, Renee LaDuke, I think, had a good uh, hand in, in writing this up. Uh, I'll just read through it quickly. It says, uh, the following is intended as an explanation for code updates, which contain more stringent requirements than those contained in a previous code edition and the impacts of those changes on existing electrical installations. On adoption of a new edition of a code, an existing installation in compliance with the previous edition of the code in force at the time of the installation is generally not required to be upgraded to meet the requirements of the newly adopted code. And we know that. Um, we, uh, if we see something in an older installation, and we, we usually talk about code of the day. But there have been instances, however, where an existing installation is deemed to pose an unacceptable risk, despite having met the requirements in force at the time, the code of the day, that it was constructed. In those cases, new legislation is normally introduced to mandate that the installation be brought to current code requirements. And here's a good example, would be mandating of smoke alarms in the late 70s to be installed retroactively in all homes, old and new. So there's a good example. Um, modifications to an existing installation that introduce changes to the characteristics of the installation would require that part or all of the installation be made to comply with the requirements of the current code in force at the time the modifications are made. This should be discussed with the local AHJ prior to design and construction. So that's a nice piece on that. And there's an example, uh, an electrician working on a smoke alarm and as you can see from the picture there it, it looks like it's a, a an older uh, home that's been updated uh, or not or in home or or something else but it's uh you get into you know a lot of uh things that have been built yet in yesteryear and uh so uh those are the kind of things that our seos have to deal with sometimes when they go out in the field 
Another stand data that uh, came out recently was uh, dealing with section zero on street lighting and primary metered installations. And again, kind of touches on that piece of uh, demarcation points. Um, there has been uh, installations where street lighting used to be done by the utility and then all of a sudden it's taken over by another entity. But we also have primary metered installations where again, the utility stops and instead of continuing on with their distribution, they'll stop at a certain point and, and then and the rest or, or allow the rest to be installed, uh, designed, installed and maintained by, by another entity. You often see that in the university campuses, maybe hospitals, uh, you know, those kind of things in municipal settings and so forth. Um, so again, we've already talked about how there's two codes, the part one code and the utility code. And this stand that I brought out that uh, ownership notwithstanding, if the street lighting installation on the primary meter distribution or, or primary meter distribution systems under the care and control of the supply authority, it shall meet the requirements of the utility code. If however, these installations are under the care and control of an organization under, other than supply authority, they have to meet part one. And uh, again, it talks about the exception with accredited corporations that are authorized to provide services under part one and the uh, utility code of course can do that but uh, so it's good to ask ourselves those questions you know which code applies here and why and so that's basically there's an example of uh this is what uh, i think it might be fort edmonton park and you've got street lighting in there you've got uh, other things and uh, it's a primary metered site uh you know the whole site is is not uh, the, the electrical infrastructure on the site does not belong to the utility, but the municipality may have hired the utility to have care and control of that equipment uh, and, and so that they could apply the utility code and not the part one code, which is which can be much more stringent. Again, because it's uh, assuming that there may not be an engineering department, a maintenance department and so forth. Here's another stand data on, in part one that related to part one on a meter mounted uh, transfer equipment. Uh, Generalink, I think is one of the names I think of when I think of that. Um, and uh, this was a, a request from, uh, I think uh, some IBs because our field evaluation by SPE 1000 has a limit on the number that can be done and you can see it at the bottom there under the code references. Uh, item C, equipment sold in quantities of not more than 500 on a national basis. And uh, with all of the you know floods, fires and so forth happening across the country, um, having a meter mounted transfer equipment became fairly important, even to some of those people who were against them at first. Uh, once these, uh, you know, it's easy to say, uh, you know, this stuff might be dangerous, let's not use it until you're in a situation where power is out, how are you going to get power? And so um, I think in the next slide, there, there's, there's what it looks like. So basically you see the meter there and then you see the cord that goes into the meter. That cord is connected to a generator. So the generator starts up and basically starts your house back up at a reduced load. And so um, what we did was we issued a variance, as you can see here, basically um, leaving that 500 unit limitation or maximum so that uh, we have uh, this type of thing take place safely uh, during an emergency. So the power's out, you get fire, you know, fires, floods. Uh, if you have uh, this uh, kind of meter mounted device that's approved, properly approved, not counterfeit or anything. And uh, then you can uh, take a generator, start it up, hook it in, it does its thing. And you may have uh, uh, your house uh, back up and running at a reduced load, but uh, at least your heating is on and so forth, your lights and, and so forth, whatever the generator can handle. And uh, that's a lot better than not having anything. So uh, that's one of the things uh, that we did in a, in a stand data. It's on our website. 
Also, uh, we issued a stand data for protection of automobile heater receptacles, and we added this and electrical vehicle supply equipment. Of course, as we all know, electric vehicles are here. Uh, they're ramping up. And so we're seeing a lot more uh, charging uh, stall, you know, installations. And so, um, you know, the, the, the rule, uh, the stand data we had before, on rule 2-200 provided protection for automobile heater receptacles and so we just realized that well we should provide that now for the same kind of protection for the uh, this charging equipment that's starting to be installed because of the advent of electric vehicles and so forth so we went through and and reworded the uh, the original uh, stand data to include uh, electric vehicles so that's what you see there also um, Another stand data for part one uh, that uh, is out there, it basically recognizes uh, what's going on in the gas discipline. And um, it, uh, we see that rule 2-326 refers to CSA B149 uh, in the natural gas and propane installation code. Uh, we also see that uh, there's been a variance uh, issued under the gas discipline, which affects uh, that rule in Alberta. So in some instances, uh, the recommended one meter clearance is varied to 300 millimeters and, and there's a, a link there for that. So we make reference to the CSA B149, but uh, we're also letting people know that uh, there's also a variance uh, on that. And so uh, the one meter clearance is varied in some cases to 300 millimeters. So check on that with, uh, you know, with your gas, uh, SEO and so forth, and that's uh, and, and I think throwing the flag, so to speak, so that uh, people are aware. This is uh, installation of the identified conductor. Another stand data on part one. Um, basically. Um, Tailing of that conductor, pig tailing of the neutral. Um, so if there's a two wire circuit, it's not required, but if it's fed from a multi-wire branch circuit, like a th three wire and so forth, uh, pig tailing is required as per rule 4-0304. So uh, that's uh, another stand out that was issued. This is the one on the bonding screw. So what's happened is um, some of the uh, light switches that we get that come from the States have a bonding screw on them. Here in Canada, as soon as you install one of those uh, light switches, it's, uh, it's already, the bonding is already complete. But in the States, that's not the case. So they have to put that bonding screw on. So of course, because can the Canadian market is smaller than California, um, they don't go through the process of removing that screw part necessarily. So this is talking about that. Um, were, uh, the bottom paragraph, it was reported that some manufacturers include bonding screws and others don't include them when shipping to Canada. It's been clarified that as long as the switches are screwed into a metal strap, providing continuous bonding, it should be acceptable to the AHJ. So that provides a level playing field for all the SCOs in the province on that issue. Uh, another one talking about uh, uh, gas discipline again. You know, Industry is reminded that where uh, HASLOC components are certified, but the entire assembly is not certified, that there is a standard out there, uh, 6007-9-46 from CSA. And again, it's a part two standard for equipment. Um, it should be used to uh, make sure that that installation and the equipment is safe. We also had a stand data on arc fault protection for ground mounted solar photovoltaic systems. And so question the validity of requiring a DC arc fault circuit protection on ground mounted systems. Those are the systems that are mounted on the ground and not on the building. Uh, the original intent of the arc fault circuit protection requirement is to protect against structural fires. 
when solar systems are installed on or above a building. So this one here, what we've done is uh, ground-mounted solar systems not installed on buildings uh, may omit that arc fault protection, uh, providing the following requirements are satisfied and maintained and that the vegetation around the area of the solar installation is controlled as to mitigate the possibility of a fire spread. So uh, that was a standard and providing equal or greater level of safety and uh, that was uh, issued across the province. Um, we have our uh, Section 64 uh, variants on rapid shutdown and I think this is the one that uh, talks about if there's a fire alarm system that can be interconnected with uh, the solar system and that the fire alarm initiating device so if somebody pulls the fire manual station it should be acceptable as a device used to initiate rapid shutdown so uh, that's what and out of there was for with regards to rapid shutdown which of course protects firefighting firefighters when they're coming in to uh, to fight the fire and also uh, in lieu of the within sight of the array uh, item in, the, in that section the rapid shutdown initiating device uh, can be marked to indicate the location of the array it operates uh, but it still has to be within nine meters so sometimes it's within nine meters but maybe it's down over the edge or something and it's not within sight of the array and this provides equal or greater level of safety by providing some additional marketing requirements here we have electric vehicle charging systems another standout that went out uh, we had a situation where uh, the uh, the uh, control systems for these charging stations were arriving um, where you could set the demand load lower than what the maximum was. So for example, the maximum would be 100 amp at 240 volts for a house, single phase. And you could set the, de the demand to uh, 40 amps, uh, 240 volts, single phase. So uh, the interpretation was that uh, manufacturer's instructions require that an electrician set the load. So this may be acceptable provided that in addition to any code required warning signs, a warning sign is provided to indicate the maximum demand load setting of the electrical vehicle charging station. So if you want to do the 40, you have to put warning signs in there in order to do that. So that uh, that's how we arrived at that one. Here's a draft one that's actually going to be uh, presented at the sub council meeting on Monday. It's uh, one on uh, electric railways. Basically the situation we have there is that as we all know, both the city of Edmonton and the city of Calgary have electric railways, LRT and so forth, C-Train, whatever the names you use. And um, as we already mentioned, well, we have two electrical codes in the province that we're supposed to apply to all of our electrical installations, the utility code or the Canadian Electrical Code Part 1. Well, in discussions with the, uh, the cities, they said, well, actually what we've been doing all along is that there are some portions of the, uh, of the electric railways that we have that uh, neither one of those codes uh, basically work. And we've been using more specific uh, codes and standards that deal with electric railways for the, for example, the DC traction power system that uh, actually makes the train move. So we, uh, we know that, uh, you know, the, uh, the train system is gonna be originally fed in the substations and so forth by uh, uh, AC power from the utility, but then it's gonna be transformed to, to DC to, at the end of it to operate those trains and they call that the traction power system and um, it's not again we took a look and it's not you know it's it's not it doesn't fall under part one and, and it's not regulated by the utility code so um, basically we're gonna you know we're proposing that uh, we maintain what's been done so far in that both the city of Edmonton and Calgary have an engineering departments and so forth and make sure that all of these installations are properly engineered and safe which they have been we've had no issues and we're going to maintain that approach that uh, we have there. So that's what that's uh, talking about that draft and data that's coming up uh, for our consideration at the uh, sub council meeting on Monday.
Okay. There's another one um, that's in draft. That's um, our section 64 on uh, on um, solar and so forth. One of the things that we had in there was we had references to uh, uh, to uh, standards. Uh, uh, the way we have it in Canada is that if you don't have a standard, you're all of a sudden you're making a product, you don't have a standard, but you want to get it approved, you can produce what they call an ORD, another recognized document to do that. And uh, so uh, we had, uh, you know, that system going along nicely. And then uh, at some point in time, uh, some of the, uh, the uh, standards development organizations, uh, they came up with something else uh, called, uh, I forget what it's called now, some kind of a letter, an LTR anyway. And uh, we were talking about LTRs and, and uh, all of a sudden, it, you know, nationally, it was, uh, everybody was reminded that uh, basically, you know, we have standards or we have ORDs, you know, for, uh, for these, uh, for solar equipment and, and any equipment, we don't have LTRs or anything else that, you know, are officially recognized by the Standards Council of Canada. So um, we, you know, the, uh, the standards development organizations and CBs and IBs were all brought on board with that and promised to uh, weed those things out and bring everything, roll everything back into ORDs. So basically that's been done now. So uh, this standard is simply being updated to refer to standards and ORDs, but not LTRs or anything else that uh, may have popped its head up before. So that, that standard is about. And then we go on to the Consolidated Memorandum of Revisions, which is, as you see, a copyrighted document from CSA, which shows all of the uh, changes to the uh, that they've made or the, that, that have been agreed to by the Technical Committee on Part 1 uh, with its final meeting in June that just went by. So it's done now. And this is uh, the document that came out as a result of that that shows uh, all of the changes. It's 300 pages long. You know, I certainly couldn't go through it. Uh, all, uh, you know, it would take a couple of days, which is basically what you do when you go to your uh, code update course. You know, you take a two-day code update course and they go through it in a lot more detail. They go through all of these changes so that everybody's up to speed on, on the new code. So this, this applies to the 2021 code that will come out in January. So uh, what, what I have done though is I've, I've just shown a couple of highlights just to uh, whet your appetite for, uh, for what's coming. And I can go through those now uh, quickly. And uh, again, this is kind of what your appetite for when you do go to your uh, code update courses. Uh, some of them are one day, a little more brief. Some of them are two day, a little bit more thorough. And uh, you'll see that coming. So, uh, and the uh, the 2021 Part One code will be uh, will be published probably in January of 2021, and it will be adopted and come into effect force here usually in February of 2022, unless of course the minister decides otherwise. So that's, uh, that's how it works here in Alberta. So we still got a little bit of time before this. Uh, we're still in 2020, so it's, we're not talking uh, 2022 before it comes in force, but it's nice to see what's coming. So I'll give you a couple of highlights here. And again, here I show that uh, approximately two days for a thorough review of all the sections. Uh, you can do it more briefly in one day. Um, if you were going to do the general sections alone, and I went through the general sections, which are 1 to 16, sections 1 to 16 and 26, um, you know, that's approximately two hours solid just to go through that. Um, there are some uh, general highlights that I can go through now, again, very, very quickly compared to all of the, the above. <laughs> the first thing uh, we see when we start going through some of the highlights for the 2021 Canadian Electrical Code Part 1, which is shown in the Man Memorandum of Revisions to the 2018 Part 1 Code, is cable tray. We all know that uh, as SEOs that uh, cable tray has always been talked about as a raceway. Uh, that's changing in the 2021 Code. No longer a raceway now, it's going to be a supporting means. So that's a big change and of course it's going to have a ripple effect throughout the Code. I think they've gone through and tried to address all of that, but if they've missed anything, then it'll be in the 2024. But uh, that's a big one right there. So then on to the next one. 
we've got identified the identified conductor, of course, and most SEOs know that uh, the identified conductor we're talking about uh, the neutral conductor and it's white or gray. Well, the reason it was uh, gray at one time was because that was uh, the color that was easier to manufacture. But uh, of course, over time that's changed and white is uh, no problem. And now what we're finding is that with our communications cables, they'll often use gray for something else. So in order not to have that uh, conflict, they've started the process of getting rid of gray being uh, the neutral or the identified conductor and just uh, having it as white. So that means that you'll see coming. Definition of voltage. Uh, for years, we've uh, known that in Canada, we have extra low voltage, low voltage and high voltage. We don't have a def definition for medium voltage as they do in other places, but uh, that's been uh, the norm. And I think what they've done is they've expanded on that a little bit um, for AC circuits and DC circuits, as you can see there. Um, and then they've talked about basically the RMS and the, versus the peak voltage. Uh, so for AC circuits, you know, low, extra low voltage is not exceeding uh, 30 volts. But for DC or for peak AC, it's 42.4. Uh, low voltage is the same type thing and high voltage is the same type thing. One of the things you'll notice though is that, um, again, 42.4, any SEO know that that's usually the square root of 2 times 30. Um, what happened was I think there was a typo or something in the uh, in in their process and when when they talked about it at the other end the thousand volt end they talk about a thousand volts and then a thousand sixty volts and that's not root two as you can imagine I think a thousand sixty volts might be root two or 750 so that was going to get changed but it didn't so they've already I've already seen the, the ballot go out to change that to a higher number that would be, so the 1,000 volt stays, but the 1,060 gets changed to root two times 1,000 would be what, 1.414, uh, so is that 1414 14 volts? But anyway, you can keep your eye on that one, but they're, they're you know, like it, or, like it or not, there's what they have coming for the new uh, definition for voltage. Uh, at the bottom, you can see that the voltage of a circuit used to be defined as the greatest RMS, root mean square effective voltage between any two conductors of the circuit looks like they've deleted it and, and again so I, I actually asked the question of the project manager how can you delete that like you know we've always known that you know if, if, if it doesn't say anything you assume it's RMS oh he said it's still there it's just an appendix B so this is one of those cases where um, something looks like it's deleted from the code and it's not it's still there it's just in a different place so that, that's a good reminder for myself and a good reminder for everybody that when you see something deleted from the code don't assume it's gone unless you're sure. Check around. It might be somewhere else. And that's what I did in that, in that case there. So, yep, we're still using RMS. Is, you know, if it doesn't say anything, you assume it's RMS. Where does that say it that? It says that in Appendix B. So, anyway, that's that one there. Um, another highlight for the uh, 2021 code. You can see here damage and interference, uh, Rule 2 032 of the Part 1 code. Item three has been added, and uh, it's got to do with flooding that we get here, obviously, uh, regularly, or it seems to have been regularly here in Alberta. Electrical equipment that has been exposed to ingress of water. So I'll be subjected to evaluation to ascertain whether the equipment be placed back into service. So that's actually uh, on the agenda for our meeting on Monday as well with the sub-council. Um, you get, you know, Think of a house, it gets flooded because it's in the floodplain of a river, uh, like we had in, uh, you know, High River and so forth. And then the water leaves, and then the homeowner wants to get the wiring checked uh, and put it back into service. So he hires an electrician, the electrician comes in, checks everything over, dries it all out, uh, does a mega test on it, and it all passes. So he says, good to go. If we, you know, under this new rule, that wouldn't that wouldn't meet the rule because now it's subject to evaluation by who certified that wiring. So let's say it's CSA approved. Now it's like, well, what is what would CSA say? You know, or the manufacturer? You know, what do they say about this 
type of thing. And, and again, those are the discussions we're going to be having on, on uh, Monday so that we can uh, see if we want to change anything or come up with something uh, in the form of a stand data for when the 2021 comes in. So uh, those are the kind of discussions we're having. And uh, that's that one. So again, a lot of these ones are, I'm sure, eyebrow raisers. So uh, uh, hopefully it's uh, keeping your attention. So thank you very much for that. And we'll just keep on going here. Uh, this one here, it was uh, a deletion. Uh, and basically what I've highlighted is, uh, I've highlighted it was a rule and I apologize because I didn't uh, put the rule number there at the top or anything, but th th this is a deletion in from the 2018. They're gonna delete a portion of the code that basically refers to table 39 and I've underlined it there, table 39. So basically the reference to table 39 and table 39 itself, it looks like it's gonna be disappearing. So again, keep your eye on that. A lot of people maybe use table 39 for, uh, for services for single dwellings and so forth and wire sizing. So uh, keep your eye on that. I, I'm sure it's again an eyebrow raiser, controversial. And uh, if you have uh, any issues, of course, you can always approach myself or the Safety Codes Council and uh, you can put that, uh, those uh, official requests uh, on the agenda of the uh, council meeting. There's another eyebrow raiser for you. Here's another one. Uh, we've always had the rule where it is known that electric space heating and air conditioning loads are installed and will not be used simultaneously. Whichever is the greater load shall be used in calculating the demand. So in other words, you had air conditioning, you had heating, you didn't want them fighting each other and uh, tripping your main breaker because they're both on. Uh, but what this has done now with this change, as I read it again, you'll see that it's added something. So it says, where interlocks are installed to prevent simultaneous operation of electric space heating and air conditioning loads, whichever is the greater load shall be used in calculating the demand. So under the 2021 code, it's gonna to have to be an electrical interlock now. It, you may have been doing that already, but if you haven't, it's kind of forcing your hand into doing that now rather than just depending on making sure that it doesn't happen. So it's uh, firing an electrical interlock to prevent simultaneous operation of heating and air conditioning. In section eight. Another one in section eight, uh, the number of spaces for both branch circuit overcurrent devices. Uh, well, it used to be, it used to say number of branch circuit positions, but now it's number of spaces for branch circuit overcurrent devices. Uh, you can see a big deletion there. Basically what they've done is they've just um, made it look a little better and, and, and a little bit more exact. So here it is here now, instead of having all of what you saw before there, all of that in the code, it's gone down to this. So basically two new rules, panel boards installed in single dwellings shall have at least four additional spaces left for future overcurrent devices with provision for a two pole device at the time of the original installation and panel boards installed in each dwelling unit in an apartment or similar building shall have at least two additional spaces left for future overcurrent devices with provision for a two pole device at the time of the original installation. So that's kick that up a bit there, hopefully that's, that reads better than what they had before and a little easier to deal with. So we'll see how that rolls out. Um, maximum number of outlets per circuit. Here's an oldie as well. There shall not be more than 12 outlets on any two wire branch circuit. We've known that forever. So now they've uh, made it a little bit more complex because of the advent of using 20 amps like the Americans. We used to be just 15, but now we use 20 amps for branch circuits as well. And of course, we also have the 80% and the 100%. So uh, now we, we still say what it says in the original with the 12, out, 12 outlets for the 2R branch circuit, but that's on a 15 amp branch circuit with an 80% uh, breaker. If uh, you go to 100% breaker on a 15 amp branch circuit, now you, get, now you can go to 15 outlets. If you're going to 20 amp breaker with 80% 20 amp breaker that's 80% rated, yet you can go to 16. And if you got a 20 amp breaker that's 100% uh, rated, then you can go to 20. So that's basically what that's done there. So it makes sense, but it's uh, basically you know, expanded on, on the original rule on, uh, on how many outlets on a branch circuit. Also, 
when the receptacle is used as an outlet, it uh, says that one outlet would be a duplex receptacle. If you've got a triplex on there, then you, can, you would consider that as 1.5 outlets. And if you've got a quad on there, you'd consider that as two. So uh, that's uh, basically some of the changes regarding, regarding that rule. Number three, uh, the number of outlets shall be permitted to exceed the maximum number permitted in some rule or one because it's changed now. So, so it's basically been reworded to me to, to match what it says now in some rule one. So that's that portion. Here's one on uh, impedance grounded systems, uh, section 10. I apologize for not putting the section on there, but anyway, um, in, it shall be monitored and can, you know, uh, and then they give all of that. You can see what's crossed out there. This was the, this is how you would monitor it. Well, instead of having that, it started to get more complex and they added stuff. So now they've introduced table 17. Do I have it there? Yeah. They've introduced table 17. So then they've, you know, once they introduced table 17 like that with all those requirements, then they, they changed the rule accordingly so that they took out the stuff that's in the table now and just said, go to table 17. So that's for uh, Also a roof decking has been, uh, I know at the annual meetings for a while now, they've been talking about roof decking and the problems they have with, uh, you know, roofs being installed and, and uh, drilling through conduits and wires and, you know, it can end up being a real mess. So this is a new uh, section on that. And um, yeah, I, can, I can read through it quickly. It's uh, cables or raceways installed in accordance with this section shall not be installed in locations concealed within a roof decking system where the roof system will utilize a screws or other metal penetrating fasteners. Notwithstanding one, the following circuits will be permitted for installations in locations concealed within a roof decking system, class two circuits and embedded trace heating and then where wiring is concealed within the roof deck system in accordance with two, a warning label should be installed. So that's uh, some uh, so basically in addition to, to the code from the 2018 to the 2021. Also there's uh, messenger cables. Uh, it talks about the messenger cables, uh, how they're attached and so forth. And it's, it's a whole new section. Uh, it used to talk about um, neutral supported cables. So now it's been expanded and basically they've added this section here on messenger cables. So uh, it's uh, self-explanatory, but uh, just a uh, note of it or keep an eye out. If, uh, if you deal with that, it's, you know, overhead services uh, coming in and so forth, that uh, this will be a new requirement for messenger cables in section 12, rule 12-320. Uh, series rated combinations. Uh, this one here, they've added F, which basically uh, the sum of the rated full load currents of any motors in the system connected directly to the point between the series connected devices does not exceed 1% of the interrupting rating of the lower rated circuit breaker. So basically what this is doing here is this is making allowance for the motor portion of input into any, any fault. So uh, with series rated combinations. So uh, just a heads up for that, take a look at that. If you're using, if you're taking advantage of uh, series rated breakers and so forth, uh, and you know, you know what that means. And this is just an additional rule for that to take into account the motor contribution to a fault. Section 16, um, there was uh, last two outputs. Um, there was some work done throughout the code talking about conductors and insulated conductors and so forth. So you see the word insulated was added in one. Also uh, in, in two, it says transformers or other devices having class two outputs shall be protected on the supply side by an overcurrent device with a rating or setting not exceeding 20 amps. Again, with the introduction of 20 amps as, as brand circuits. So that's uh, in 16 for methods of installation on the supply side of overcurrent protection transformers or devices having class two outputs. So that's another new item for the uh, 2021 code. Uh, and again, you can see I'm going through the general portions of the code, basically sections two through section 16. 
and then 26. There's an eyebrow razor as well. It says, uh, where electrical equipment vaults or electrical equipment rooms are sprinklered, the electrical equipment contained in such vaults or rooms shall be protected where needed by non-combustible hoods or shields arranged to minimize interference with sprinkler protection. That's we, a lot of us uh, on the construction side, we, we've known that for years. It looks like they deleted it. So, uh, you know, again, probably an eyebrow raiser, controversial, uh, but the powers that be at the national level have determined that this is not something that should be in our, that's required in the installation code. Uh, it doesn't mean you still can't do it, but uh, they've, uh, they've taken it out. So, um, so, you know, maybe because some of the rooms don't have uh, sprinklers in them, so forth, so on. So it was, there was a whole lot. And like I say, if uh, anybody wants the details, you can always contact me, but it looks like, uh, it looks like they've taken that out and I don't think they moved it. <laughs> so, uh, so that's an eyebrow razor. So keep an eye out for that. In fact, it's at the sprinkler equipment. And so, um, so there's that one. And also, in section 26 with transformers, uh, an addition was made for a transformer continuous load. I'll just read the rule. It was added in item two. It says, notwithstanding sub rule one, where dry type distribution transformers are controlled by a distribution transformer energy management system with scheduled power dispatch described by sub rule 81612, the continuous load of the distribution transformer shall be permitted to be based on the maximum load allowed by that system. So that's the, you know, it's self-explanatory, but it's, uh, it looks like it's a new rule being added in. So uh, make a note of that in section 26 uh, for that. So um, besides that, we also see here that uh, a lot of items in section 26 have been moved to section 64 for renewables. Um, special terminolo terminology, location of storage batteries, ventilation of battery rooms, battery vents, battery installation, wiring to batteries, and so forth. So all those rules that used to be in 26 have been deleted but moved. This is another example of just because they deleted it doesn't mean it's not there, it might have been moved. So in this, in this case here, make a note of that, they, they cleaned up section 26 a bit by realizing that some of the rules in there really belonged in section 64, so they moved them. And again, that's in the 2021 code. Another uh, one in section 26 deals with branch circuits below ground level in areas designated as, designated as flood hazard zones, where branch circuits are located below ground level in areas designated, designated as flood hazard zones, ground fault protection shall be provided to de-energize all normally ungrounded conductors for the ground fault setting sufficient to allow normal operation of connected loads under normal conditions. So they're adding ground, ground fault protection, GFP, uh, in flood zones. So that's a new rule there in section 26, self-explanatory. And also here, branch circuits for dwelling units. What do we see here? This is uh, basically um, the addition of uh, dwelling units created by subdivision of a dwelling unit and with the smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms installed in the additional dwelling units to be permitted to be connected to the branch circuit installed in the original dwelling unit as required by Rule 32-200, and then it gives the the, uh, the the reasons why, and provided that um, the panel boards, uh, you know, are labeled and so forth. So that uh, again, that's self-explanatory, but it's uh, it's a uh, an addition to the code under 20 under Section 26, and circuits for dwelling units uh, dealing with. Uh, smoke alarms, carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide alarms, that type of thing. So uh, take note of that. And also in section 26, this is an eyebrow razor as well, contentious, all that stuff. All receptacles have, having CSA configuration 5-15R, 5-20R installed outdoors and within 2.5 meters of the ground should be protected with the ground fault circuit interrupters. GFCI, class A type. So now we used to have parking lot plugs and so forth that didn't have to be. 
now they have to be you know, starting in 2021 code 2022 when we adopt so yeah that's a new one again contentious eyebrow razor and all that but there it is and so i'm making note of that section 26. also the sump pump receptacle uh, for buildings located in flood hazard zone has to be located above the flood elevation or marked as suitable for submersion so there's that one again a new new item and that's basically it for what I have for this presentation, which is basically some highlights for the general sections in part one, sections two through 16 and 26. Of course, there's lots of other changes for the rest of the code for the, uh, you know, the sections 18, 20, 22, 24, and then 32 and up. Uh, there's lots of changes there too, but again, that, would, that wouldn't be of interest to the whole audience because then you're getting in specific areas. So uh, that was good for, for that. So uh, I guess I'll uh, leave it at that for now and go into the question period. For, uh, for uh, question number one, again, it was uh, consumer service grounding, part one, Canadian electrical code. Scenario, the consumer service grounded at the service box in the service section of the panel, the grounding conductor terminates on the factory installed ground lug. The neutral terminates in the neutral lug, which is bonded to ground with a factory installed screw, pictures attached. Note ground bushing installed at the meter end. Question, must the grounding conductor terminate on the neutral bus if the neutral is bonded to ground by a factory installed bonding screw or strap? I've said yes, and the reason I've said yes is because of what I found. And one of the ways I, whenever I get a question like this, code question, that kind of thing is, I think in terms of almost uh, four areas I go, obviously there's the rule, that's number one, but then check to see if there's any appendices reference, like appendix B, that would be number two. Uh, that can give you, even though it's 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 uh, not it's not normative, it's still informative, and that can help a lot. Also, we have uh, the handbook, which is also informative and can help a lot, and we also have uh, our stand data, which would provide you with either a bulletin, uh, interpretation, or a variance, perhaps, on that code rule. So that's my thinking process when I go looking for uh, answers to some of these questions. Uh, here we have the uh, grounding connection for solidly grounded AC system supplied by the Supply Authority, Rule 10-210, and it, uh, it's self-explanatory. Uh, here's the Appendix B note, again, which is uh, talking about the rationale, the intent, and so forth. Uh, then it gives you some, some figures as part of Appendix B, Figure B 10-5, and as you can see there, when you look at that figure, it shows the grounding electrode, and the grounding conductor connected directly to the neutral bus inside the service box area, which would normally be locked by the utility, okay? So that's what I see there. Uh, here's the bonding bus down below, which is in the distribution part, which is accessible to, to all, you know, to qualified persons, all the electricians and so forth. Um, so, uh, there, there's that figure. There's also the handbook gives some more rationale and intent with regard to that rule. It also has a figure, and again, that figure shows the same type of thing in a different way. If we look at that top view, it shows the neutral conductor to the distribution equipment. To the uh, also shows the service conductor coming in, and it shows the grounding conductor to the grounding electrode connected to those neutrals on that neutral bus. So, and there's the pictures that were sent in showing the, the incoming uh, wiring and, and so forth, the, the two hots, the neutral, the ground wire, and uh, also the, uh, the way that the, uh, uh, the neutral bus is connected to the path of the box and so forth. So it's all there. And again, based on what I could see, what I could find, you know, I can imagine that having that neutral connection in the in the, locked by the utility would would prevent inadvertent disconnection at the at the bonding bus. And again, just to, to be able to do what it says here seems to be predicated on the uh, those those diagrams. If you change the diagrams, all of a sudden you can't do what it says here. So that that's kind of the way I looked at it. Of course, if, if anybody else has anything that could add to this or what, what have you, that's fine. 
but uh, that's kind of my approach and my thinking for that question. That's question number one. So I thought I'd share that with everybody. And again, not going through it in too much detail. We'd be here for an hour. But uh, that's, that's kind of how I went through it and what I found. And um, there's that question. Okay, very good. So now I can go on to uh, question number two. This was already sent in. It's about an air conditioning unit. So the scenario is uh, you have a, an air conditioning unit, nameplate, uh, minimum circuit ampacity, MCA of 32 amps, 230 volts, lock rotor amps, 100. Um, MFS, maximum fuse size or CBS circuit breaker size, 50 amps, picture. Uh, question, must the overcurrent device be 50 amps? And I said, well, it has to be 50 amps max. That's what it says, uh, you know, uh, in more, more than one place. It says, basically says that. So I said, yeah, it has to be 50 amps max. And then they asked the question, would a 40 amp overcurrent device be acceptable? So well, I, again, I went through the process just like before. Here, here are the applicable rules. Uh, 28708 has already been referenced. Uh, also, there's 28202 talking about uh, when the overcurrent protection is marked on the equipment as it is here. And, it, and again, it, it, it's, it's, it's all was written like this, shall not be exceeded. Because of course, if you put a lower uh, overcurrent device on, on there, it's even safer from that point of view. So it says, you know, that's how it's written, shall not be exceeded. And here's that, uh, that marking there that they sent in. But the, the, the thing I came up with is that so in theory, yeah, you know, you put a 40 amp, it's even more safe. But in practice, no. And why would I say that? And because if you if you if you start to reduce, if if the you know the manufacturer, the code is telling you 50 amps, and you start reducing that, well, you risk nuisance tripping. Okay. And um, the SEO, when he gets there and says, Why did you put a 40 in? And if you say, Well, I put a 40 in because it's cheaper and still meets the code. You know, um, that may not be an acceptable <laughs> answer because then you leave, you know, the installer leaves and now the homeowner is stuck with, you know, it's it's a safe installation, but it's going to start nuisance tripping. And it may not nuisance strip today. It may start nuisance tripping as the device gets old, you know, as the air conditioner gets older. So uh, for that reason, you know, the SEO may, you know, and they have other, other rules at their disposal, you know, workmanship, so forth and so on, that they may say, you know what, you know, this is going to start tripping and you really should put in the 50. So, uh, you know, that's kind of how I'm thinking about this one. I know it's kind of a wishy-washy answer and not clear cut, but I'm sure that a lot of people that are listening are thinking the same thing. Uh, so uh, if you're going to try to, you know, if you're going to want to reduce from a 50 to a 40, my first question would be, why would you do that? And uh, again, the first thing that comes to my mind is nuisance tripping on, on startup and so forth, or as the machine uh, gets older, you know, um, you're going to get nuisance tripping, which couldn't have to happen until until it you know starts going over fifty. So anyway, that's how I kind of thought about that one. Hopefully, I you know I didn't uh, wishy washy it too much. But uh, anyway, that's kind of my answer on that one. Question two. Uh, question three was a cable tray, which we know in the new code will not be a raceway, but it is right now. And uh, he made reference, or she made reference to Rule 12, 2202 on insulated conductors and cables and cable trays. And uh, in there it says, um, notwithstanding subrule 2A and B, type TC-ER tray cable were not subject to damage during or after installation, shall be permitted to transition between cable trays and between cable trays and utilization equipment or devices for a distance not exceeding 1.5 meters without continuous support and 7.5 meters were continuously supported. So then the question was asked, does the TC include tech cable? And I've said no. And the reason why I said that was I went to table 19, which is referenced in, uh, in rule 12, 2202. And uh, it indicates that type TC cable is designated as tray cable. Uh, tech uh, cable or tech 90 is designated as armored cable. They're separate and distinct cables. So that's why uh, I've said that the tech cable is not uh, TC cable. Um, and he asked another question there, or made another statement, dropping out of the cable tray 
uh, SEOs would call the cable has to be tie wrapped and supported uh, within 300 millimeters. And, uh, you know, when we look at the uh, code rule again, uh, under the non metallic sheath cable, it has running of cables between boxes and fittings that we're all aware of. And, you know, as soon as you leave a box within 300 millimeters, you have to, you know, support the cable and so forth at intervals not more than 1.5 meters throughout the run. Uh, and of course, under armored cable, it makes reference back to this rule. So it also applies to armored cable, which what is what a thick cable is. So then he asked the question, can you drop out of the cable tray and enter an enclosure without having a support within 300 millimeters? And hopefully I'm not you know, mistaken on this, but um, I've said yes for the TCER and no for the Tech 90 because in that rule, it talks about TCER going 1.5 meters, whereas Tech 90 falls under this rule, which says it's gotta be within 300 millimeters. So um, and, uh, hopefully I'm not uh, making an error on that. If uh, somebody can show me something else, uh, by all means, but uh, that's, that's my thinking process going through that question, uh, which is uh, what we're talking about here. So uh, that was question number three. And uh, question number four was substation fence grounding. And I'm kind of glad this one was asked because uh, we'll go through it and, uh, quickly. It says, uh, is the intent of the Canadian Electrical Code and the Alberta Electric Utility Code regarding substation fencing that all intermittent posts must be grounded? So my first thought on that one was, uh, well, um, this installation, the substation and the, and, the, and the associated fence, it only falls under one code. Uh, one or the other, not both. So um, the accredited corporation that sent this in, uh, as of late, it appeared that they were not accredited for the utility code anymore, only for part one. So if you're accredited only for part one as a, as a, and, uh, to make sure it's safe grounding of metallic fence enclosures of outdoor stations. Also, again, going to the handbook stations and fencing, and it also has some pictures, figure 3618 grounding at the corner post. And uh, also it has another one uh, fencing inside the ground grid electrode area. Give some more ideas about uh, what's going on there. And so, uh, and also figure 36 test, 20 boundary fence and station fence. So uh, again, going through that same, that same thought process of, you know, if you're looking for safety requirements uh, and it's part one, you start with the actual rule, then you go to the appendices if there's anything there. And then after that, it doesn't hurt to go to the handbook, even though I know the handbook has mistakes in it. You know, I know it's not enforceable. I know that it's informative. Uh, one of the things that I can mention, the difference, I often thought, what's the difference between Phoenix B, which is informative, not normative. It's, again, it's the same. You know, it's not, it's not normative. It's informative. Appendix B is. And the same with the handbook. Appendix B is uh, consensus-based. That is, it it's, goes through the balloting process. The handbook does not. The handbook is just written up by CSA. Uh, and it doesn't go through a balloting process. And that's but it's still all good stuff, you know, assuming there's no mistakes. Uh, it's informative. It can it can educate an SEO on the intent and the rationale, and get them in the proper thinking process, so that when they do go back and read the rule again now, after going through all of the stuff in the handbook and Appendix B, then it becomes more straightforward. It's oh, that's what that meant. So that's one of the processes that we follow here at Alberta Municipal Affairs when we're asked question on a code rule. Is we will go through the process of of uh, looking at Appendix B, looking at uh, looking at the handbook, looking at our stand data to make sure we've got everything in, then go back to the rule, read it again before we make a decision on, on our, you know, our interpretation of what that rule means. So uh, that's my thinking process on question number four with uh, substation fence grounding. 
And so that was the four questions that I got ahead of time. So now I guess uh, we can take a look at some of the questions that have come in since then. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, there, we did have some interest in maybe also having access to these uh, question PDFs. I will need to check with um, the individuals who sent the questions and especially the ones with the pictures. Uh, but if that's amenable to you, Clarence, I know um, we had some people thought it would be uh, helpful. Sure. And you, yeah. Them. And you've noticed already, I've kind of tried to make them generic. I haven't mentioned any names or anything like that, yeah. as far as I know. Okay. So you guys Perfect. can do your, do your check as well. And uh, if that's mm -hmm. okay, you can do that as well. Yeah. Sure. I'll follow up with uh, the question askers and just make sure they're comfortable. Um, all right. So we had a few uh, questions that came up. Um, uh, on certain slides. The first one came up, I believe it was slide 53 when I went back and checked. So uh, that was about maximum outlets per circuit. Um, so uh, the question was regarding four or two breaker spaces. Are those full breaker spaces or half breaker spaces? That's a good question and I can, and I, and I, I think they were full, but I can't, I don't have anything in front of me right now to say that, but it seems to me that they were full breaker spaces. Like I know that you can get those mini breakers and uh, I don't think it was talking about that, but again, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the you know, the, the substantiation on that. So uh, again, I'm giving a wishy-washy answer, but uh, that was discussed and I'd have to go back and check. And again, if you want to leave that question with us, I can go back and check and see if that's in the, uh, in the ballot. As, as far as that goes to see that, was this intended for, to include the mini breaker spaces or regular breaker spaces? So I understand what the question is. And uh, I think it was the regular breaker spaces, but I'd have to confirm that, um, take note of that, and we can do that out, uh, offline. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, if anyone wants some follow-up uh, for their question, uh, just go ahead and email that communication email. Uh, you can also email um, uh, the duty officer at safety services for code clarification questions, but for these specific questions here, if you want to follow up, feel free to get in touch with me and I'll forward it along. Um, all right, the next one was on uh, slide 69 um, and the individual was just looking for some clarification on the sump receptacle rule. I don't know what exactly they need clarifying, but maybe if you could just speak a little bit more to that, Clarence. Okay, well, again, slide 69. Some pump receptacle, again, it makes reference to Appendix B. And so for buildings located in a flood hazard zone, some pump receptacles referred to in Rule 266561B shall be A, located above the flood elevation or B, marked as suitable for submersion. So um, I, uh, I, I don't think I've ever personally seen one of those, but uh, you know, First, you have to get the information on the flood hazard zone. That's obviously be information available from somebody. And if you fall within that, then you either have to raise your receptacle up out of there, which, you know, could be done, and then you use uh, the proper wiring to go down into the below the flood elevation. Or if that can't be done, then you would have to have it marked as suitable for submersion. And again, it's, it's, it's I guess they, had, they must have had problems, obviously, with with floods and 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 uh, all of a sudden, um, I mean, stop operating because the, uh, the the plug that it's plugged into shorts out because it's it comes submerged. So this is a way of stopping that. Uh, again, uh, we can if if you like, I can follow it up, take a look, uh, get, you know, go get the ballot uh, for additional information uh, offline and uh, get more information to you. Just make a note of that and let me know uh, offline after the fact and. Uh, We'll take a look at that, thanks. All right. All right. Uh, there are now large scale energy storage projects going up in Alberta. Who is inspecting these and under what code? Okay, large scale energy projects. So I've, you know, I've heard of and talked to SEOs who are involved in that. So, um, as far as who inspects them, all of our inspectors in Alberta report for electrical, they report to, as far as I know, either a municipality, an agency, or a corporation. So some of the municipalities or corporations will use an agency, but basically you got municipalities and corporations, like Suncor is an example, one for example. Uh, so 
who who's putting up the uh, the, the the energy uh, project. Uh, if it's a utility, um, you know they may they may do it under their uh, utility code and with their engineering department. But if it's not a utility, then it should be done under Part One, and it should be being inspected uh, either. Uh, by the SCOs in a corporation, if it's if it's a corporation that's doing it, if it's not, if it's a municipality, there should be a permit pulled, and uh, and uh, inspections done that way. Um, if anybody's aware of that not happening, uh, then we need to know about that, and so uh, you can let us know, or or the Safety Codes Council that you know of a project that you don't think there's any inspections on, <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll iron that out. But uh, that's normally how it would be done. Yeah, thank you. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, put those um, contact information for uh, the Safety Services Area of Alberta Municipal Affairs and our contact information as well in the chat. Just as soon as uh, we're on to the next question, um, the next question is: Now that we have generally identified the demarcation points, can we now use the utility values for opacity in underground service cables from the meter base to the utility transformer? Okay, so um, if I can, that was a nice long question, but um, now that we figured out where the demarcation is, um, they're they're wondering, are they wondering, is it about um, the available fault currents that are, or, or or are they talking about the utility values for for the um, for the underground cables? Because if the cables um, are under, if the cables are under part one, you got to use part one. You can't use the utility values. If it's on the consumer okay. side of the DMARC, you got to use part one. Only the utility can use the their values for their cable. Okay. Well, if the person who asked that question wants to uh, provide any follow up information, we we would have time to um, to to address that at this point. Um, but uh, if that kind of answered the question suitably, then I'll just uh, move along to the next one. Um, which I think is just a question about the additional code changes that uh, you didn't look at. Um, the question is, did they make a change for sealing receptacles to require them to be a twist lock? I'd have to go look. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head on that one. Um, if they did, it would be in the memorandum of revisions. Um, so I'd have to go look. So if you make a note of that, we can, we can follow that up. Um, yeah, I'm going to actually ask the people who asked the questions to request a follow up. Uh, just I, I can see myself really getting um, uh, disjointed and not realizing whose question was whose the way it's presented to me now uh, in the chat because uh, I'm not attached to anyone's emails or anything. So I wouldn't have a way of getting back to you. So please do request follow up. I will put that information in the chat uh, now. Um, so I'm going to just ask the next question. We have a couple more coming in. Um, the first one is, will the reclassification of cable trays from a raceway to a support system eliminate the use of table 5C for derating um, the opacity of the cables in the tray? Um, I would have to, yeah, I would have to check I uh, didn't do anything on the tables. Well, one of the things uh, that I noticed when they gave us the MOR was that all the tables were like pictures. They weren't searchable. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I'll ha you mark that one down for later. I'll have to go back and check. But uh, they may have done something with that, so I, I don't uh, have the answer off the top of my head. Okay. Um, and um, then just now, um, is the MOR available to the general public? Uh, no, it is not. As, as I sh showed on the first page there, I forget which slide it was, but uh, on the first page, it's kind of, that's why, yeah, we, yeah, they, the CSA has it, um, has it copyrighted, and uh, yeah, it said right on there, CSA group, no part of this document may be reduced or redistributed in whole or in part by any means whatsoever without the prior permission of CSA group, request for permission should be directed to them. And permission is granted to members of the committee, like myself, that is responsible for the development of the draft to reproduce this draft strictly for purpose of CSA standards development. So um, we, you know, I have it, 
And then the Safety Codes Council has it as well because we're all involved in adopting the Canadian Electrical Code and making recommendations on same. So uh, we have it, but we're not allowed to give it to anybody. And that's, uh, again, it's, it's, uh, that's a CSA copyright. Yeah. Uh, all right, another one, another question we just have. Uh, any information on changing to single grounding point and four wire secondary cables? Uh, yeah, I, I can give a little update on that as far as I know. Um, as you know, and as was put through in uh, June, and I forget which year it was when we were in Halifax, which is a couple of cycles ago, or a couple of years ago, um, Rene did a Section 10, Rene Leduc did a Section 10 rewrite because he's the chair on grounding and bonding in the Canadian Electrical Code Part 1. And one of the proposals that he made was to delete uh, the grounding of the neutral at the service box and just have the secondary system, which is, which our service, our consumer services are part of a secondary system from usually a utility transformer. And usually the, the, the exo point of the transformer, the, the neutral is, is grounded at the util, on the utility side. So they wanted to put forward that, that we don't ground this, the, the neutral in the service box, but we depend on the grounding of the neutral in the utility side. Uh, that was defeated uh, majorly uh, at this point and has been for a while now. It's, it's been thrown around, discussed, and uh, basically uh, it, uh, some of the uh, members and powers that be took it actually back to the, uh, to the above, uh, the, the committees that are above uh, the Part 1 committee and the committees for the utility, the, the national utility codes and basically said that we don't want this overlap. You know, we want, you know, the, the, the system has to be grounded on the consumer side. So right now we do have single point grounding, but on the consumer side of the demarcation point. There has to be one ground, the neutral has to be grounded once on the consumer side of the demark. And uh, I don't see that changing in the foreseeable future. It's not to say it'll never change, but there was a drive to get rid of that and that's been defeated. So right now, and in the 2021 code, the, uh, the, the situation we have with the grounding of our systems on the consumer side is that we have single point grounding on the consumer side of the demarcation point. Thank you. All right, and then we have a follow-up question for the uh, answer for question one. Um, and uh, the individual is asking, how is the system ground terminated on a two position lug in a standard meter base? Uh, yeah, that's we're getting right down to the nitty gritty now. Uh, what I will say with regards to the meter bases is, is that um, when, uh, as you saw in 2018, how uh, for a service uh, you could either ground the neutral at the service box or ground the neutral in the at the meter base, uh, with all all that's involved in that, um, I think that the manufacturers were caught unaware, so to speak. In that it was it was almost it's very hard to do to do it in the meter base. Since then, and I've you know been in correspondence with some of the manufacturers, they've updated their product lines and so forth to be able to do that. Um, this question sounds like one of those questions where, well, how do you do that? You know, we don't we don't have anything that'll do that. Um, if you know if there the, there are manufacturers that that would be more appropriate. To answer that question, if you want to, if you want to follow that up, I can I can um, touch base with the manufacturer on that specific question, and uh, see if that's where that's what this is about. But yeah, when they first introduced grounding the neutral at meter basis, uh, that caught uh, industry unaware, so to speak. And so, if this is part of that, it's being addressed slowly, uh, and uh, I can follow that up after uh, offline. Thank you. 